Hey guys, hello. It's November 15th. I know, that means it's my birthday. 23 years ago today, uh, my mother gave birth to me and I, I existed in this world. Uh, and last night, actually, I just want to thank the Comedy Quarry. We had a roast. Uh, that was interesting. I'm going to be talking a lot about that. The, I, I apologize in advance uh, for those of you who are listening to this. This feels like it's going to be one of those fucking podcasts, one of those shows. It, like, cause it's concerning for uh, my generation or our generation because everything you do on the Internet, people will see. And this is going to be one of those uh, rants or like one of those introductions where I'm going to look back on it if I ever make it to 40 and be like, what the, I was a fucking idiot. What was wrong with me? Huh. But, just, just, you know, we, we all have those moments. Like when Rob Ford said he had a drunken stupor, that was me last night. I, when, when you, cause there's so much societal pressure. Have fun your birthday. It's your birthday. Have fun your birthday. And people feed you alcohol. They feed you drinks like it's fucking Petro. You just keep dramming it, jam. It's like fucking jam. It's like that's what's literally keeping you alive, man. I was I, I have not been that drunk in so fucking long. Like, as soon as I left the bar, I I, I ended up on some guy's couch. Not just some guy. If, if like this is my rule. If I ever wake up with another dude next to me or a farm animal, I fucking quit. <laughs> if I hear if I hear bat or oink, I'm fucking done. I'm gonna pull a Josh Haddon and just go sober, get a hot girlfriend for three months, <laughs> and then and then improve my life and run a comedy club and you know. <laughs> he's actually on the podcast right now. He's here. He's a, he's the host of uh, Sorry I'm Funny. Uh, I haven't done this in a while. I, like I said, I apologize in advance, you guys. It's just when I, I hate being hungover and doing some of these, but this is how I choose to spend my birthday with you lovely people who hopefully will listen and stuff. But honestly, where the fuck do I start? Woke up. It, it, like, do you ever just wake up and it's so fucking hot that you don't care how cold it is outside, but you will like run out naked just to get like a breath of fresh air. I, I was in. Do you the, run out naked? I, I, I don't run. I, it was more like a, you know, a waddle. It's a shuffle, according to Cameron Adams. <laughs> I, I opened up the door. Swagger, I, I think he said. Oh, yeah, no, it's totally swagger. Him, him and I have uh, fucking swag. Cam and I would be like a great rap group because nobody would expect. We'd be like the best drug dealers, like hustlers, man, because nobody's expecting that. But shout out to 50% Cam. 50% would be Cam's. <laughs> 50%. Half man. And that's it. Like, you know how, like, like uh, you know, how, you know how, like, in sports, I'm like, oh, he's half man, half amazing, or half man. It's like, with Cam, it's just half man. And that's it. <laughs> half man, that's fucking it. <laughs> like a cyborg or something? Half he, man, half he's machine? Made, he is, man. He's a fucking cyborg. I, 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 t- <laughs> I told that to, to my friend the other day. She's like, what do you mean a cyborg? What the fuck is that? Mean? It's like, it, it just means, I don't know. He's fucking Ironside. You do the math. I, didn't, I, I don't watch science fiction movies. Shout out to Cameron Adams. <laughs> I love you, dude. I, I, you suck that you missed my birthday, but hey, it's, it's good that... You're uh, you're making. We you're, still roasted him without. Oh, him being we still there. Fu- we we shit on everybody last night. That was the beautiful part about last night, and and that's kind of why I wanted to do the roast. And it it was initially C J Bernauer's uh, idea because we did it two years ago at, at a, a formerly known as Cassis, and uh, um he decided to, uh, I decided to do it again because I didn't know what the fuck I wanted to do for my birthday, and uh, we, maybe we should probably close that door. Maybe. Yeah, yeah, let's do that. We're we're live in this. Well, not live. We're recording this. We're in the C J M studios. Uh, like I said, Josh Adams here. He runs the Comedy Quarry, and he's done a bunch of other things. We'll we'll get to him in a second. <laughs> he he doesn't mind. Fuck that guy. I know. Fuck that. <laughs> fuck that guy. Yeah. No. But yeah. So I, I guess I'll just take you through what happened last night, because uh, I don't know where the fuck to start. To be honest with you, you know. But like you know. Oh yeah. Waking up in like a drunken sewer. It was it was so cool. Like whenever you wake up and you get blackout drunk and you don't know what happened, you're like Sherlock Holmes in your own life because you're just looking for clues to figure out what the fuck happened. Like, it's like there's a Tim Hortons bag, a half-eaten donut, a fucking dead guy back there. I have skid marks like all over the fucking floor. I'm in my underwear. I don't know what's going on. And when you have to go to class and present something, it's like doing the walk of shame, just in a different context. So hopefully I've made some of you guys feel better about yourselves. Roll of shame. Uh, <laughs> to, the roll of shit. <laughs> Always so fucking literal. <laughs> see, see, it needs see, to be funny. I know. I know. The fucking roast continues. It just like doesn't stop. It's still your birthday. It's still my birthday. So you have permission to do it. <laughs> I haven't this. said happy birthday yet, and I don't think I'm going to. It's so. okay. doesn't matter. Gives a fuck. Facebook did it, didn't they? Facebook needs an app that schedules. You can just go through all your friends and write the messages all at once. Yeah. Like, you know, like scheduling 
uh, I don't really give a shit about you, but yeah. I'm going to make your day better on your birthday. Exactly. Like, like that should be that. What that? There's an app for that. Oh, yeah. For not really caring about your friends. And it, it, it's There's nice. an app for that. It, it, it's nice because it's, it's complete narcissism. I mean, I had that moment today where I looked at Facebook and I was like, oh, I want to see how many people are on my timeline. You know, it's all complete ego. And then I go back and check if I got more than other people. Yeah. yeah you get awesome. more than other people or you get that one chick or that one person where it's like, how the fuck do I know this person again? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <That's laughs> like, it, 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 it's like, you know, we like especially as comics, man, like we meet so many people on a consistent basis. I feel I feel bad when I don't know people's names. But do you ever like have full on conversations? It's like the Seinfeld episode. You have a full on conversation and you don't know the person's name. It happens. It's it's rare. I try to remember everyone's names. Uh, obviously, it's good. It's good business. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it's tough. Like uh, Stephanie Clark came up to me last night and said, right. you know, hello and great job blah 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 and i was like who the fuck is that i was like some some cute blonde chick's talking to me and i don't know her name and then i was like oh yeah i remember her uh yeah and then i t t talked to her on facebook and pretended like none of that happened hope she doesn't listen to this uh, that's a, well shout, shout out to stephanie she, yeah. she she said she'd come and she came because a lot of people say they'll come to shows and they don't come and you know c c we we don't get upset if you don't come just fucking tell us that you're not coming i, I appreciate the blunt honesty yeah we uh, gave away uh free drugs for everyone and we had uh, we had we thought 60 people were coming yeah so we had 60 joints rolled 60 uh packs with two e-tabs 60 grams of mushrooms or like for everyone and we had all, and we had all this extra drugs and uh i just felt bad it, it was like joshua tree with the stage and a mic that was it it was uh we were starting the party early <laughs> <laughs> sorry so i'm just gonna take you through what happened with the roast because I, I might as well and you're here and because you you host <laughs> You hosted last night. That was that was a fucking big things, no. Like I, you know, Cam, my uh, a friend of ours, uh, Cam recorded it, and I'm glad he did because we had some epic moments. We started out Cam with legs. Yeah, Cam with legs. Cam, Cam, uh, Cam that travels. <laughs> <laughs> History, Cam. <laughs> yeah, he's uh, he recorded the whole thing, which I I'm glad that he did that. And the show was really good. We started a bit late because no none of my friends ever come on time, which is why they're all my friends and. Because they probably thought I was gonna be fucking late, because the black dude never shows up on time, and I fucking don't. Other other ra other people in other races do. I'm just you have two punctuality handicaps. I do. Being black <laughs> and not very mobile. Or yeah, if my chair if my chair fucking shuts down. Oh, actually, I I, I forgot this story. Well, I was uh, I was coming out of uh, I was coming out of your club uh, that one night, and I was I was I was with uh, I was with somebody, and we were driving. Uh, I was driving, and uh, it was like it was not really that cold, but my like cord was hanging out. And it got stuck on a fire hydrant. And it yanked it out. So for like a good twelve, like twelve to fifteen minutes, I couldn't move my chair. Like my chair was just stuck. What cord? Like uh, there's there's like a little like cord on the side of my chair. It's uh it, it like plugs into the platform up here, like into my joystick, it's where like like it supplies the power and where the car batteries take. <laughs> Don't you find it funny? It's called a joy. Stick. I know a joystick. <laughs> I, it's obvious pun. <laughs> wah wah. <laughs> You guys make your own fucking jokes. See, and th this is what I have to put up with. See? <laughs> it's okay. I, I asked for it. But yeah, so it got stuck, and then this drunk homeless guy ended up helping us. So, wow. Yeah, because... Cause Too bad no one helped him. Yeah, because the girl I was with was freaked out. I was like, oh, my God, are you going to be okay? So, and she's, and I'm just like, I, I don't know. Like, uh, I was trying to figure it out. I, I don't know. I was very high, so I didn't care. <laughs> I didn't care what was happening. I'm like, let's figure it out. But yeah, we got stuck for a bit, and the, the drunk homeless guy helped. So wherever you are, dude, thank you very much. But yeah, anyways, I, I get sidetracked because that's just what happened. Because I got high. Because I got, got high. high. <laughs> no, no, yeah, shout out to 2005 references. I know, right? <laughs> or earlier. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. So uh, anyway, so we, we started the roast a bit late. And none of my friends are on time. It was fine. And then Josh goes up. You, you did a, a good song, by the way. It was an epic song. Oh, thank you. Is, uh, <laughs> I forgot I played the song until right now. Did, did you, you forgot you played that song? It was a good way to introduce no, well, I just thought it'd be a good warm-up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, because cause actually Gad uh, Holland did about five minutes, and Gad was on Gad fire. did 12. He ran the light. Oh, of course he did. What up, Gad? Yeah, well, you know, Gad, Gad likes to talk, but that's why I love Gad. You know what I mean? It's it's like his his superhero joke makes me laugh every time about fucking Captain Planet. Yeah. Was, yeah, because I didn't know what Captain Planet was when I was a kid. I didn't even figure it out till later that they were racist. But, oh, wow, yeah. <laughs> I love Captain Planet. It was cool. I used to play like uh, the kids' clan meetings I used to go to. It yeah. was great, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. So, uh, anyways, um, Josh goes up, plays his song. Uh, we get a few of the roasters up. Uh, the vibe was actually really positive. You know, it was, it was more positive than I thought it would be. I, you never like w when you put on shows, you never know who's gonna show up. 
it's always a crap shoot no matter how hard you promote no matter how hard you advertise because you know you've seen it like people will book and sometimes they won't show up you know like there's one night where you're expecting like what 12 like 12 20 people and maybe five came but anyways so uh, a couple guys go up they do their thing uh, cj's on stage and uh th- there are these dudes who i knew from uh, uh i only knew one of them from upstairs these four black dudes uh only one one guy i knew from represent high school, represent from high school and uh you know nice guy he's all right and, you know i just say he's like hey what you up to tonight man it's your birthday and like you know they bought me a shot and they're like oh um uh i told them i said i'm having a roast downstairs you guys are more than welcome to come you know it's only five dollar cover and they're like yeah We'll, uh, we'll come check you out, man. Sorry, you know. So How'd they say uh, it? Sorry. It's like, yeah, man. We'll yeah, man. Out. We'll come check you out. Yeah, yeah. The, yeah. I, they didn't sound like that, but. I don't know. <laughs> sorry. Your black's so, better than my black. Yeah, it's, it's pretty much by default. <laughs> TikTok be nickel. It's I don't know. How's that for Ebonics? It still works. It was quarter two. I said you better have my papers before it goes straight up. <laughs> but I don't know. Oh, man. And <laughs> I'm going to get to that because you had one of the best lines of the night after this happened. So the roast is going fine. Everybody's doing great. And all of a sudden, these dudes stand up. And they smash their glass. It was like, boom. And uh, they smash their glass. They run up to Sage like, man, fuck all this shit, man. Fuck all you Caucasians, man. Like, Dave, you don't have to play with this shit, bro. He's like, you can do this, man. He's like, Martin Luther, Martin Luther, represent. They're fucking patting their chest. And I, first of all, Martin Luther is different from Martin Luther King. Correct. So you got to get your story. I, I, I thought of that immediately, even before I think Andrew Andrew said. owned it, yeah. Yeah, well, because Andrew's Mr. History, you know? Like, and he, you know, I had a class with that guy, so he's, he knows his stuff. But uh, they went up, and, you know, and he's like, man, fuck that. And, like, they just caused us. He's like, fuck all you Caucasians. Fuck all y'all. And I was like, y- you remember that episode of Chappelle's show when uh, they had that where keeping it real goes wrong? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of yeah. what it reminded me of. It reminded me of that. You remember that? You know that show, The Boondocks, where, uh, where they had the episode called The Nigga Moment episode? Where, like, uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it's for those of you who don't know. Uh, the Boondocks is a cartoon. It was called the Nigga Moments. Yeah, the, the Nigga Moments. It's literally called that because any chance I can to say that word, I take it. It's yeah, it's, yeah. Why not? It's like, I, I know you, dude. I, it, it's all in context, you know. People get upset. Martin Luther about, was a German monk, which is funny. I know, <laughs> right? So and, and it's uh, and CJ's fucking German too. <laughs> so <I know>. sorry, bro. <laughs> <laughs> right? So Martin so, Luther's a oh, German he's monk. He's a fucking German monk. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like Martin Luther. Martin Luther. I was like, yo, that, that, that is not the you same mean, fucking guy. King Junior, you mean? King Junior. Uh, I know. <laughs> Martin it, it, Luther. It, it's it's like when you're saying the sentence like it was still buffering. You know what I mean? <laughs> It was skipping? like it was Mar- yeah, it was fucking skipping, man. It's a hip hop joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they do that, man. The fucking the vibe is so awkward, and everybody's just looking around. Like I look at CJ, CJ looks at me, and I'm like, just give me the mic, and then I I do a couple of jokes just to try and like say, hey, look, it's okay. Nobody's gonna fucking. It's not gonna be the Source Awards. Nobody's gonna shoot at the screen and fucking you know. And uh, you had one of the best lines of the night because after that you went on stage and what what was the joke again? You just said. Uh, no, you said that uh, as soon as they left, there's like a smell of like... Oh, I said I knew they left. Yeah. Oh, wow, yeah, I could tell those those four guys left because the smell of uh, bus passes and fat girls' vaginas... Fat, fat girls' vaginas. <laughs> ...had left, yes. Which is also a Wayne Bowles joke. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, no, it, it, it was funny, too. I think and, ragging on black dudes <clears throat> having sex with overweight white girls is a, is it's a world joke. It's, you know, it's, it's, well, it's the 21st century, man. You know, people, uh, people understand more about people. Than there's more think. internet available. There's, there's more lot, things. There's a lot more things available. People have more of like that knowledge. And I think that that's, what's going to bridge the gap essentially. Maybe I'm, maybe it's being idealistic, but. Do you think being able to watch interracial porn on the internet has cut down on the amount of interracial relationships? No, I, I think it's I think it's made some dudes feel inaccurate. Like I watch it and I feel ina- an inaccurate sometimes. Inadequate. Inadequate. Sorry, it's. No, I know. You were inaccurate. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's you know. So, so I, I guess it all depends. I mean, it depends on what you're into. Like I, I've read somewhere that like racist dudes like in like southern states watch that to get off, and then just just because they hate it so much, it's like because I guess like the same type of endorphins like flow like when you fight. And when you come or when you have sex, apparently. The feeling of an orgasm yeah. and uh, complete rage, as well as pain, are almost uh, chemically yeah. uh, identical. Huh. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Yeah, but anyways, it, it, it was funny, too, when uh, Jeter came up after and uh, he said, I'd just like to thank my sperm for coming up. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, he, he, was, he was on fire that night. He, uh, he, the, the, 
because for some of you guys who look on my Facebook, this is also going to sound narcissistic, but for some of you who look on my Facebook, there's a picture of, uh, of uh, I think it was a Black Panther. Or like, I don't think it was Jesse Owens, but uh, it, was, yeah, it was Black Panther, like the, dude, the guy doing like a fist in the air. And then there's another picture of a claw, like a crab claw. Jeter did a joke last night, which basically said, um, uh, Dave, uh, basically how I give I, I give oral sex to women, or like not oral sex, but how I can, you know, do the work down there is great because my curves work, like the curve of my hand works. And then he compared it to like a lobster claw and said every time he can just dip it. <laughs> <laughs> like, and that, the fucking, like the room exploded, man. People were like, fall, I, I, on stage, I, I could not have... I, I couldn't hold it together, honestly. Some of the stuff that you guys came up with was was really genius. <laughs> yeah, Jeter did a great job. It was very honestly. funny, very funny. Honestly. Lobster claw, and he's saying, and and the, uh, it gets up there properly, hits the G stop, the G spot. The problem is, is that uh, when he he's with bigger women, uh, at the end they want to like <laughs> crack the claw and eat the meat. So <laughs> that's <laughs> the, that was funny. That was my favorite line of the night. But yeah, it, it was it was fun, guys. I, I I know this has gone for about fifteen, sixteen minutes. If if I bored you, I apologize. But this is my life, <coughs> and a part of this podcast is sharing my life with you and sharing other people's lives with you. And today we're going to be talking with, uh, well, sharing the life of Josh Haddon. Uh, Josh Haddon has had an interesting life. I'm sure he could tell you that. Uh, you you've been in Windsor for like seven years, right, dude? Uh, no, not quite seven. In and out for seven. I've been here officially four years last october so or four years this october so right yeah right yeah cause 49 he, months i know right it's fucking crazy because uh you know i went because uh he opened the comedy quarry in about june and i gave him a call and then we started talking you know and uh then the rest of us just started flocking to it and everything and uh you had like a bunch of businesses on the side you've done like a lot of things but what made you like want to get back into comedy did you just like want to do something that you're passionate about again? Or like I used it? to be involved in a, kind of like a timeshare business, which a lot of people listening know is a terrible, <laughs> terrible business, bad reputation. And I, was, I didn't feel good about what I was doing with my life. I sold the business and stayed on just as a consultant. Um, I had a stroke because of the stress last year and mm-hmm. uh, kind of had to figure out my life. So I just floated around with some ideas and some concepts that I wanted to do. Uh, I wasn't very healthy, took some time off, and wanted to get back into, I've always been artistic, and I, yeah. uh, in sales presentations, things like that, I was always using comedy, I, I did it for years before, and before I sold out, I guess, is uh, <laughs> the proper way of saying it, and then uh, um, the other comedy uh, club on the street shut down, Yeah. so uh, Dave and I were talking, and I was like, you should open a comedy club here, and yeah. that's just how it happened it happened over a beer and it was so ironic because i I recorded my special there about a year ago and i think it was jeter or somebody said man wouldn't it be cool if there was like comedy down here or something like that and it's just it's funny how like certain things work out in that context you know because it's given a start to a lot of new guys uh like you've you've helped with the locals in that respect and you've helped a lot of people in that regard too you know because it's, it's people are finally starting to get the word out and stuff you know when i say oh i'm going at the comedy core they're like okay i know where that spot is you know what I mean? like, yeah, that's cool yeah. and uh it helps that you know with the university and stuff like that now because you you have a show uh on here also called uh sorry i'm funny where you get what like weekly guests or like weekly uh, every week yeah on <coughs> c jam 99.1 fm which redefines radio in windsor and in detroit shameless plug you can also check it out at <laughs> cjam.ca sorry i'm funny.com sorry i am funny.com um i the letter m yeah, it's a show, 4.30s on Wednesdays. I host it with the lovely Freddie Dolly. Uh, we have any all our international headlining acts that come through the Comedy Quarry. We play a clip of their stuff, talk to them on the phone. Mm-hmm. You know, they tease Windsor, tell stories about Windsor from uh, years gone by. And, uh, yeah, it's a fun show. And then we just dissect life for the last 20 minutes of the show. And it's it's pretty fun. It's, I like doing it. Yeah, I, I've, I've sat in on one of them, and it was pretty good. Um, the, the yeah, football, you did, yeah. The football segment and stuff, you guys have pretty good chemistry. Yeah, I it's mean, getting better every week. I think we've only done 12 or... It, it, it's, isn't so. it funny how, how much talent's in Windsor and how hard it is to like for some people to manifest it? You know what I mean? Because there's a lot down here, and a lot of the times, not talent, but just the city in general gets discredited, and for good reason, obviously, with some of the reputation and with a lot of the stuff that's been happening here, but at the same time, there's, there's a lot more to it than I think people give it credit for. 
Windsor has an untapped potential. Windsor could be the next Birmingham. Uh, you know, Windsor, Walkerville, what the BIA has done in Walkerville has been incredible. I don't know if you remember, but Walkerville, where they yeah. have all the great events now, where the Walkerville Tavern is, that used to be rampant with prostitution and drugs, and now mm. it's the hip hot <laughs> spot to be in Windsor. Things are cheap, which makes for an easy way to attract artists, uh, recording, you know, that artistic expression. It's so cheap to pull off what you need if you wanted to film a pilot, if you wanted to do a, a webisode, you know, or a, a yeah. web series. It's it's a great place to be. We have all the talent and tradespeople in the world that aren't aren't working um, or they're underemployed right now, and it's it, it, we just need one major step uh, towards economic redevelopment mm -hmm. and the city will be one of the world-class cities to live in in Canada. I, I think Gad Holland yesterday called it the Miami of Canada, which I think was... That's <laughs> funny. It was hilarious. And, and it's kind of ironic because that's when we noticed like the, the, the black dudes who interrupted and he was like, man, dogs in Canada are so nice. <laughs> it was so funny, like especially what Chad Swire, but he's like, man, he's like, it's like, man, your money's so great, man. Like, there's people playing hockey and shit, and they're like, you know, sipping coffee, and you got white people smiling and everything. That's so funny. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> but yeah, yeah, no, I, you know, getting back to that, I mean, it's, uh, it's just interesting how certain things manifest and how other things are able to like play out, because uh, you know, you basically start from the ground up as well. Uh, because uh, how long how long did you do stand up before uh, you stopped doing? Stand -up? I did stand up actually. Uh, grade seven talent show, grade eight talent show, final assembly was the first three shows I ever did. My parents, part of the name, sorry, I'm funny. My parents always told me I wasn't funny. You know how parents are, right? Yeah. You're not funny. That's not funny, Joshua James. Yeah. Right. You know that's what I got my whole life. Uh, uh, it's not funny. No, this isn't funny. Like over and over again. So it was like, mm. sorry, I I am funny. You know. Uh, and then also my critics, uh, even our peers, uh, don't think I'm funny. Like they'll, I'll make them laugh one day and they'll be like, last night, Andrew Realm came up to me and he's like, wow, that was awesome. You were actually really good. <laughs> right. And it's like, okay, you condescending piece of shit. Like, you know what I mean? Like you were writing with crayons, you know, when I was up touring, you know, Western Canada and the U S so, um, yeah, I just, it's uh, it's kind of silly, but yeah, stand up I guess. Yeah. O two, O two, oh, like all, obviously grade seven and eight, and then I did my first pro am at a Yak Yaks in O two. Mm. Did a bunch of those. O three, uh, took some time off. Went down to Vegas. Did a ton of stand up in Vegas. I uh, performed at the Las Vegas Hotel. The mm. Beach. It's closed now. It used to be a seven hundred person venue where I opened for Sarah, Sarah Silverman. I have opened for Greg Proops, Deborah D. Giovanni out in Calgary at the Laugh Shop, all over nice. Montana and, uh, you know, North Dakota, nice. uh, Midwest stuff. So, long time, and then I took about five, six years off. I did sales presentations every day, which obviously, the way I address audiences had a humorous tone, but... Uh, it, it's, it's so funny how, like, certain professions translate into other professions. Any comedian could be the best salesman ever. Oh, yeah. Except the laziness that comes with being a comic. <laughs> Most comics are lazy, right? Yeah, so. we, we well, it's not, like, you know, I heard somewhere comics like the coast or if you have like an hour and stuff, you keep doing the hour. I mean, it, it's really hard to keep trying to develop new jokes every week and to write new stuff every week. It's, it's almost impossible. But at the same time, even if, like the personal challenge that I've given myself is that I want to at least try and premise on on stage. Or at least when I have something, I want to try new on stage because, you know, after a while it just gets. It's like with anything, man. After a while it gets stale. Like even today in the, one of my classes, my stage management class, uh, they were, the the guy was talking about how when some of these production companies and these theater companies, um, they'll have people and actresses, actors and actresses that will stay there from the time like they're like little kids, about seven, eight years old, and so that they can grow into the older roles. Is that like, like how wow. could you do the same show for 20 years and not kill yourself? I'm sorry. Like that's, that's fucking ridiculous. Well, a lot of, and I mean this respectfully, I don't know who listens to this podcast. A lot of paid comedians, the guys who get 50 weeks a year of paid road work have done the same jokes mm -hmm. for 10, 15 years. Maybe mm -hmm. they'll add a new, a new three minute bit every year, but mm -hmm. then in 10 years later, you're still using all your set. Yeah. Um, uh, Someone said something about hack the other night, and I said, well, that's how you become a paid comedian. Uh, you know, it's very rare that someone with a fresh outlook like a like a Bill Burr or a Doug Stanhope or a Joe Rogan or something, it's very rare that you reach that level talking about that sort of content. Um, yeah. It's show business. It's it's not 
not com- it's not art. Comedy is art in its purest form. Mm-hmm. But if you want to get paid to do it, you have to sort of be a hack. You're doing the same show every night. You're pandering to the audience. You're doing jokes. They can see the joke coming, and that's not a well-written joke. And you can see these mm-hmm. great comedians that you see their jokes coming. And, um, yeah, the audience laughs because they're not educated comedians. The toughest thing in the world is to get approval from tons of, uh, from your peers, your uh, yeah, comedy peers. That, 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 that's why comedians are the worst to perform for. Right. Because there's, it's all that judgment and there's all that. Well, if you're making comics laugh, you're not ever going to get paid gigs. So, no. right. Yeah, it, it's like that term comedian's comedian. I mean, it's interesting because. Like Ron Vaudry. <laughs> I love Ron. <laughs> yeah. I like Ron. He He's actually, a comics comic for he, sure. He gave me good advice. He uh, he sat me down and I had a pretty good. You were already sitting. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> 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 the roast continues, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, no, it's uh, I, honestly I think that that's true because a lot of things are pure in terms of its initial form, uh, in terms of whether it be music, a performing art, even something as mundane as like making a house or like you know building a car in some sense. All that is pure. It's it's, it's it gets tainted when you put a price on it. It's, this is idealistic and sounds hippie, but it gets tainted when you put a price on it. And it gets tainted when it becomes a chore. Like, the reason why I've kept doing comedy is, you know, my personal reason is that. Well, obviously, I, I'm still young and I have time, but also, it doesn't feel like work, man. Like, when I'm, like, it doesn't feel like work. It's like, does this happen for you? It's like the one place where you're not in your head, where you're just completely out of your head. Like, when I'm on stage, like, I think about nothing. It's like a blank slate as opposed to during the day, you know, you worry, okay, I got to meet this time. I got to meet this person. Oh, I'm supposed to, you know, maybe, maybe I, I can't forget this because she'll get pissed at me and you know, blah, blah, blah. And all this usual clutter that fills no, your No, I hear that. Yeah. You know, but I don't know. It, it, I think it's like that with anything, man. You can find that one medium or that one, whatever that works. And it's hard because you got to pay the bills at the end of the day. And if you have obligations like children or mortgage or car payments and all the usual fun stuff that comes with being an adult. It's hard to really pursue your passion, and I think people struggle with that. I'd like to interject here. The, the advice you get, guidance counselors, who, by the way, are guidance counselors for a reason, yeah. are tell you, they'll tell you. They're, and they're, even, they're like the last people who should be giving advice. Yeah. Isn't that ironic? Yeah, it, and it, even. It, it, it's so, it's a symbolism of our society in a sense. Sure. Even like the career, uh, career guide people yeah. at your university or college. Think, think about it this way. People are going to tell you, find what you love, find your passion, and the money will follow. That's what they'll tell you. Mm-hmm. And it, you never, ever want to feel like you're working. We weren't put here for that. We're creative, artistic people. And even the people listening who are like, I don't draw. I could never do stand-up. I can't. You're still artistic in some, mm. some way. Maybe you cook. Maybe, yeah. maybe you like, right. r- like doing model airplanes. Now, I get we all need janitors, right? The, every, the world needs janitors. Yeah. But... What they'll tell you is follow what you love or do what you love and the money will follow. Don't get knocked up at 20 and then try to do that. Mm-hmm. That's what messes everything up is this, this inner like fear that especially women, that they, they're not desirable after 30 or 35. Mm-hmm. No one's going to marry them. So I see these young, potential-filled, talent-filled, beautiful uh, young girls rushing into relationships with these dudes or these – Guys, and the, the swag heads, is yeah. not going to pay the bills. You're going to have a terrible life. You're an idiot. And that's why divorce rates are so high. People are doing it young. They're stupid, um, ignorant to this fact. And I've learned, and I'm not that much older, but I left home when I was 13 years old. 13 years old. I'm 27 now. I've got the same stories. A normal person who leaves home at 21, 22, 23, I get the same stories they'll have when they're four, almost 40. Uh, because I've been doing this and I've been hustling long enough and I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky that I hadn't, uh, you know, I didn't bring a child into the world when I was unready. I wanted to. I've tried. Tried with girls. Uh, I've got other stories about not trying and then, you know, yeah. a, a correction was made. But, uh, yeah, I'm just so lucky that now I'm able to spend time. My my monthly nut is nothing. Like It's so yeah. tiny. I don't have to make a lot of money to to live well. And be happy. So mm-hmm. I just get to spend so much time on my passion. And I feel so blessed. And I remember if you told me this five years ago, someone like me was saying this. Mm-hmm. And I was working 18 hours a day at the time, wearing Armani suits every day, driving around in a Range Rover, loving life, making money, throwing throwing paper at bars. Like, a, like yeah. you know, that urban sort of lifestyle with a, with a you know, uh, upper class suit on. Right? You know, mm-hmm. that's what I was living. It was, it was like Entourage Windsor or Entourage Ottawa. So, um, 
Yeah, so you would have tried to tell that human being, that, that version of Josh then, I would have been like, you're stupid, you have no idea. But for anyone listening, if, you know, if it can help one human being, just follow your passion. Well, the problem, is, the problem is that people get caught with material things, but a lot of times is that people don't really know themselves, so we have to validate ourselves through somebody else. Well, That's look, why people run into relationships. Look around your house. Look around your house, all the stuff you have that you yeah. bought that you don't need. You don't need, you don't, oh, you, you haven't used it in a month. I wish there was a thing, you know, when you go on your ad remove programs on your computer yeah. and it tells you not used in two years, not used in three years. You know mm -hmm. where it says that when you're trying to take things off your mm -hmm. computer? I wish you could look at objects and be like, oh, this iPad I bought, not used in the last three weeks. Mm -hmm. You know, I, why do I have an iPod? I have like the brand new nice iPod touch. I have an iPhone 5. I've got an iPhone 4S. Like, why do I have these things? And, mm -hmm. it, and it makes no sense. You don't need these things. People trying to fill that gap. People trying to fill that gap with something. I mean, one, one of the best expressions that I heard, <coughs> excuse me, and if you've heard this before, if it sounds cliche, I apologize. It was a few years ago, uh, my then friend, uh, I was going through a breakup. It was around Valentine's Day. And it's kind of, it's kind of sad yet funny because like a girl shot the pool ball and like it hit my chair. And she came over to me and she's like, hey, Dave, how's it going? I was like, oh, hey, you know, I kind of give like a half hey. He's like, a happy Valentine's Day. And I was like, thanks. And then I looked at him and he's like, she smelled good. <laughs> and, uh. just, and then I just, and then I like did a shot with him and he was like, he said, man, this is what it is. This is what it is with you and this is what it is with a lot of people. With a lot of people, whether it be a relationship, a career choice, anything that you choose in life, it's, I have an empty cup. Can you fill it up for me? Here's my cup, fill it up. That's exactly it. Here's my cup, fill it up. Here, could you, could you help me? Because, you know, it's, it was only half full and the last person didn't complete it, so I need you to do the rest because I'm, I'm just going to give you this. And when you go through life like that, you're never going to feel fulfilled. You're never going to feel satisfied. And that's the biggest issue. I mean, it, like I said, you know, we, we're both comedians, so we can understand in this context. When I first started doing comedy, it made me a better person in a sense of it grounded me a bit more. It puts your ego in check because you see reality as reality, you know, and if you have a disability, it's like times a thousand because you just, you know, when certain situ situations, especially with how people interact and how they treat you as opposed to how they treat somebody else. People talk about racial profiling. They talk about, oh, this person treated me like this. I see it every single day, not just from my eyes, but from even other people who I know have disabilities eyes. So because of that, I'm able to kind of go in that direction and I'm, I'm able to see that and like i said when i started doing stand-up it's it's when i became interested in the world i realized hey there's more than just my city there's more than just my group of friends there's more than just what i perceive and it's hard for people to get out of that because it's so fucking easy to get wrapped into a certain especially if you're around shitheads and a lot of people surround themselves with shitheads because it, it makes them feel good it, it's it's like it's like uh it's like when when a girl bring like a group of girls out and they bring the one ugly chick that's not attractive or like when the guy brings out that one dumb guy that fucking starts shit and everything. It's like that with uh with in in that context. See like I I even saw like this young couple and they had like a baby, had like two kids, like a double carriage. The dude was wearing like these light up sneakers, this backwards hat, had a swag shirt on. And the girl had like this dyed hair. And like they were making out like right on the sidewalk. Their baby was like right next to the freeway. And it's like Fucking watch the baby, what dude. The what are you hell? doing? Like, first of all, where's Mari when you need him? Huh. Second of all, fucking watch your kid. Like, that's how you know that certain people are not, you know, ready for that. And I, I thought it was condescending when I was in high school. Well, your frontal lobe's not developed, and you're not, you're not ready for this, not ready for that. But it's fucking true, man. Like, it, it takes a long time for a lot of people to develop not common sense but to develop that sense of self and to develop what they know is good. And there's nothing that. worse than I only have one single regret from a whole lifetime of bad decisions. Only one regret in my whole life. And uh I imagine that there's people out there with tons of regret and I just have one and there's tons that all these people have and they mm -hmm. just they live with it and I don't want to be rude but it's like you have a regret regret of a child and I know we're getting off topic but no, I guess the positive message here is just find a way to do what you love like conventional wisdom <coughs> is horseshit it's horseshit it, do it doesn't work we've been doing that and our world is the worst it's ever been every single day it's worse off than the day before Right, and we've been doing the same thing over and over. I, Innova yeah. oh, innovation, mass production, industrialization, you know, um, uh, media, 
the media using the media as a form of information as a f tool for teaching mm -hmm. as a comparison a bar for comparing our lives to other people's lives and we've been doing that for years and the world just gets worse off and worse off every single day and people got shit to do at the end of the day people have their lives people have their families and like i said you get caught up in this realm in this bubble even like when i came back to windsor i felt like it was a bubble because there's certain times when i just come back here i'm like okay this is why I know what's going on here. And it's just like you get wrapped up in that. And it's because, you know, after you work eight hours, ten hours a day, like when I was working, I was working eight, ten hours a day. I'd go home and I just wanted to sleep. I didn't want to talk to anybody. I didn't want to text my girlfriend. didn't want to talk to my friends. Then you weren't doing the right job. Yeah, you know, and it's something like that shouldn't, shouldn't deter you from pursuing your passions. I still did shows where I was fucking exhausted. Right, but you, your, work, your work shouldn't exhaust you in a negative yeah. way. Yeah. I wish there was more time in every day. And it's not because I don't have time to do the things I love. It's because everything I do is what I love. And I want to add more projects to that in the same realm. Mm -hmm. no, I, know, I know what you mean. And, and, like, you know, and plus, after you work an 8, 12-hour day, nobody wants to hear about Benghazi. Nobody wants to hear about the debt ceiling. Nobody wants to hear about uh, slave sweatshops in, in Malaysia or the drug cartels in Mexico. Exactly. Or, or how social assistance programs are going down the drain like nobody it, it's you know even i myself even though like I, t I went on that whole rant about reality and how we see reality i do see reality but i think that's another issue is sometimes so like you know i always say ignorance is bliss another i guess technical conventional wisdom phrase mm -hmm. ignorance is bliss because those who really don't see or don't understand or don't care i think are, tr are truly happier that's why i think some of the smartest people and some of the most intellectually uh, sharp are some of the most depressed <laughs> because you see reality <laughs> in such a fucking w real context. Exactly, or they become crazy people. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I see that Absolutely. for sure. Mm. Yeah, but uh, got your hangover juice going. It's my hangover. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's just apple juice. <laughs> <laughs> Lay back, dude. My uh, literally, like, I you know, I I understand why that movie's popular, but. I think that's why it's popular because everybody's had those nights and I, uh, what I, movie that that hang the Hangover movie just you know oh I, yeah everybody fucking has had those nights and, the, and like we we even got into a debate about this in terms of like Rob Ford the, that's the reason why he's so why he's so effective everybody's got their opinions like as a citizen yeah I got I got issues with the guy smoking crack and stuff if he's running for <laughs> office but but as a comedian fucking keep him in there dude I want I want more of him. Because at the same time, you know, even though he does all that stuff, he he's real. And you're right. I think people connect to him on that level in a sense. People aren't full of shit unless yeah. they're writing a blog or a news article. Mm -hmm. People inside in their own brains when they're in a, pri when they're in a private voting booth mm. aren't full of shit. So what we're reading are people full of shit. Because deep down, you're not full of shit. You can, you can identify mm -hmm. with yourself and the mistakes you've made oh, yeah. and the bad judgment you've had, but you're still probably pretty freaking good at something. Whether you're a nurse and whatever, you black out on the weekend, you forgot to pick your kid up at school, you're probably pretty good at being a nurse and you save lives and you're great. And that's the same thing. And you know that as a voter and as a citizen and as a taxpayer, and they can see Rob Ford's been good. He's increased police, uh, lowered crime, Saved the city of Toronto millions of dollars, more than any other mayor ever has. Um, but he's made some mistakes, and everyone can identify with that. So, mm -hmm. yeah, and and like I said, there's, I I, I mean, and, you know, there's a lot of reasons not to like somebody, especially a politician, because when you're in the public eye, it's so weird being in the public eye. We are in a sense too, but not not to, of that magnitude, and not when you're a, a quote unquote representation of the city. So I can understand why you're not people, a representation of yeah. the city. You're a representation of the people. That's why I said the quote unquote, yeah. city, you know, captions. But the thing about him is, is that, like I said, people identify with that, and that's why he has a lot of followers and, and all that stuff. But th and there's a lot of reasons not to like him. But I think that the crack smoking thing, yeah, people can have their opinions about that. But like I said, we all we all see a bit of that because he said it was in a drunken stupor. I had yeah. one last night. You've had many. Yeah. <laughs> we. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's that. Well, let's fuck it. Let's get into that. <laughs> yeah, we. Uh, I think well, the last one was a while ago. You um, want to get into my drunken stupors? Okay, it's whatever you want to talk about, dude. It's it's up to you. I'm not gonna force you to say anything. Okay, sure. Yeah, I've had a lot of drunken stupors. I have. I haven't had a drink. What's the date today? What's the date November today? November fifteenth. Yeah. I'm fourteen and days away from six months without without any alcohol. So put a laugh track here when you go home and edit this. <laughs> All right, or maybe a maybe an applause track. I don't know. Yeah. Or maybe yeah. like a bottle opening, like a. Perhaps. Ch Perhaps. Ch 
Anyway. A bottle opening of like club soda. Yeah, club soda. <laughs> That's funny. That's a really good comedy club. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. Club, club soda. And uh, shout out to them in Montreal and uh, Peter. But uh, yeah, I've had drunken stupors. I've made mistakes while uh, in a drunken stupor. Oh, yeah. Ideally, let's be honest, we'd all love a mayor who didn't smoke crack, yeah. right? Uh, you know, if Eddie French was smoking crack, we'd throw him under the bus in a second. Yeah. Uh, it also doesn't directly affect us, so that's why. And a lot of people just don't give a fuck. I think that's, like, especially Canadian politics, I find. People are so indifferent. Well, this is so weird the for people. They're like, what, why are we talking about politics today? What about, you know, didn't a puppy ha- or didn't a dog have what, what's 40 going, babies in their litter? What's like, going on with the Kardashians? What are they naming their 12th kid? Or that's something? it. And yeah. I don't know if you know this. I plan to run for city council in Windsor, if not next November, four Novembers from then. Mm. Uh, I plan to run for city council. And I have a lot of things, um, a lot of mistakes that I've made in my life and a lot of things online that people are going to have to question me about. But I'm not going to hide behind anything. I'm a human being. I'm a human being who, yes, I'm flawed, but I'm sweet at balancing budgets. I'm great at networking, getting things done. I have a track record, you know, longer than uh, Ford's list of excuses on uh, things I've accomplished and what I've been able to do and the, the contacts I have. So it's not, uh, it's, you're not a representation of the city, you're a representation of the people. And the people, and now I'm going to get into it, yes, I've been drunk. I was young, I've partied, of course I have, but you grow up. And the more stress you have, the more likely you are to need some sort of escape. And I'm not advocating for crack cocaine, but... <laughs> but Just you, to make things clear. Yeah, you do need some sort of escape. Everybody does. Yeah, and that's Everybody it. Everybody has their vice. It's it's like, you know, what pe- people like to pretend cuz you, you know, it's like some women say well, I don't masturbate, I don't do this. It's like they don't want to know what the fuck you do on the weekend cuz you scare. I would rather talk to the person who's open about their past. You know what I mean? Cuz it's going to get to the point just with the internet alone, man. This like with my generation and even with like the younger ones. It's going to get to a point where when people run for office, they're going to know exactly what you fucking did. Not even just with the NSA and with spying and all the other shit. If you're exactly what you've done, it, it's it's they're just going to know what you've done because you posted online. Everything you do, this is going to be online. I'm going to regret half of this when I fucking get older. Yeah. But it doesn't matter. That's not the point. My point is that I don't think you're going to yeah. regret it. No. Not if not if you own yourself. Exactly. And if you're not electable because mm-hmm. you're a human being, then you know what? There's something wrong with politics. Mm-hmm. If you're if you're a real human being, like there's counselors that sit on the board now, uh, you know I, Drew Jelkins, Fulvio Valentinas. You don't think they've got skeletons? You don't think they have issues, their own private life? But they're it just it doesn't it doesn't come out. Do you, and do you think that's human nature though to put people who are in these elected positions up on a pedestal? You know you see it in all these different cultures, whether it's ancient Rome or indigenous peoples uh, all around the world to have chiefs or to have people deciding. Do you think that it's more human nature to kind of make these people seem like, oh, this is our leader. We must follow our leader at this, you know, because in a, in a sense, I guess people want to be led and want to be told because it's easier to do that as opposed to come up with a solution. That's yourself. what people want subconsciously. They'll never say it out loud. They no. don't want it because it's not right. It's not accurate. And that's not how it, we represent the people. They're not being led, right? Mm. The, a, a leader is someone who's like, yes, let's do this, not, hey, you do this. So a leader is more of a dictator is what you're saying. No, hey, let's do this. Like they, yeah. No, uh, yeah, the leaders we have now, it's more of a dictatorship. And, uh, you know, I mean that in the, in the most, uh, you know, joking, joking way and mm. for lack of a, a better synonym uh, to, to my thoughts that I haven't shared. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, it's, it's – it, we are the people. So I see a leadership style that should be more people focused instead of spending uh, your budgets, mailing out magnets and information, mail out surveys that you can fill out and mm-hmm. you mail back. So save the magnet. I don't need your magnet on my fridge. Send me a survey. I'm going to answer it. I'm going to put it in the prepaid envelope and send it back to you. And that's how you find out who the people are. Mm-hmm. Today I was helping up the Ottawa Street BIA. I'm going up and down Ottawa Street this morning. And there's people looking at me saying, no one has ever walked in their door from the Ottawa Street BIA. No one's ever walked in. No one has walked in to ask how they feel, what their concerns are. And mm-hmm. I, I, I just think it's a shame. It's an absolute shame. And sometimes you hear the argument where, um, you know, I've heard other people make the argument in the sense of, well, if you only have the government as good as the people, and it's like, well, the people aren't so good, and that's why. But no, the people you, are but, apathetic. But yeah, the, the people are apathetic because a lot of the times, with politics especially, and with a lot of, uh, of tax-exempt uh, uh, you know, businesses and, and stuff like that, people feel disenfranchised because they don't feel like it's a representation of themselves. They don't feel like they're being represented because if you actually had somebody who did represent the people, 
And he, like, you know, if you have a phrase, every man, he's an every man, he's this and that. Well, guess what? He's got a fucking corporate jet and he's got fucking two beach houses in Miami, in Miami Beach. So he's not an every man. Do you have two corporate beach houses? Do you have a BMW? I don't think so. No. Joe, Joe whatever the fuck. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's it's hard. Joe the plumber. It, yeah. Well, you know, that's that's five years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's it's but, you know, I, I, like I said, what I've seen, it just you feel disenfranchised. A lot of the times, too, I'm even going to bring this back to disabilities. Sometimes it's like that with disabilities, too, man. Where, you know, people, n not like people who have the disabilities, I mean, where you feel where it's like, well, you, like, especially with what I did before, because I, I worked in employment and stuff like that. I worked with uh, advocating for people with disabilities to get uh, jobs and stuff like that. And a lot of the times what I found, too, the research, some of the research I did was that a lot of employers have a predisposition for applicants who have disabilities. They would say, well, they need more sick days, they need more this and that, they're not going to be able to handle things physically and this and that. I think a lot of people see disabilities in one context as opposed to it being universal because I probably brought this up. I'm sorry if I'm boring you guys. It's the largest minority in the world. Um, you know, Disabled it, people? Yes, yes. Very underrepresented in terms of pop culture and the media, and if it is, it's done in an apathetic way or in a pity way or just to spark, j just to throw something in the wrench. Like even, even when I go on stage and even when Cam and I go on stage, it's like an event, like people pay attention because like, what the fuck is this? You know what I mean? But at the same time, good point. You know, it's so it, like, it's so true, man. You feel like you're a traveling circus sometimes. And I, you know, I've always looked at myself, uh, just as a guy, I was always treated that way by my family and by my friends and that type of thing. But in the workplace and in a lot of social aspects, it's so different, man. You feel like you're from another planet. You know what I mean? You feel like you're somebody else. And I think sometimes it's how people feel when, and when it, when it comes to the business of politics, they feel like this this fucking like he's not speaking my language. There's that disconnect. I used to think it was because all the sociopaths and they're fucking uh, you know they're lobbying for oil companies, yeah. narcissistic, and they're just fucking his pawns. Which some of them are, a lot of them are, but at the same time, there's also a disenfranchisement and there's also that disconnect. Because I I probably told this story before. I went into this restaurant with this uh, with this lawyer, and uh, who I knew through a friend. We sat down and h hung out, and the wait staff treated me very differently because of my association with this person. And I didn't, it felt, made me feel so uncomfortable because I'm like, I, you know, if I wasn't with them, I know he wouldn't be treating me this way. Right. Even, even you know, and, and if I didn't have this wheelchair, I know he wouldn't be treating me this way either. So as a result, I think that's where the conversation needs to start. I think, e even with last night, I think that's kind of one of the reasons why I'm not upset by what, you know, what, what those guys did and like what they did because, you know, even one of our friends said well it was in the right place they're sticking up for you but you know what fuck that i don't need people to stick up for me right i, I don't like whenever whenever you it's take, almost a form of bullying it's a form of bullying to assume you can't yeah because whenever you feel like you have to take the moral obligation of the moral high ground that's bullshit and, and it's it's a higher it's a higher form of condescension which is easy it's just an easy thing to do but at the same time it's not. It's not always the right thing to do. People always. People like to deem themselves the hero because they feel like they're doing the right thing. And it's funny. Lenny Bruce said that there's not really any right or wrong. There's just my right or your wrong. Correct. You know, my my perception, your perception. Exactly. And it applies to so many aspects of life, dude. And uh, it's so funny because whenever I come in interaction with that, my my interactions and my reactions are always different. I mean, last night I was more so just shocked and just wanted the show to keep going, but. I, I like I said, I, I've always felt like way. Well, you probably feel that way too, man. Like you know, not even just like being over. You know, you talked about like your family and stuff. It made you feel like that in that respect. It's tough because you you want to have your own voice. You want to make your own way as a man, as a person, as an artist, and what have you. So what what do you mean? I feel like that. Well, it, it's just you know, it's it, because sometimes people will think that they know you, or they'll, they'll assume something about you, and so you know, it it, it happens so much. But it, I feel like. It's almost on you to kind of not prove them wrong, but prove it to yourself. Because if somebody, it's, it's like that uh, that theory. If somebody tells you that you're stupid for a long time, you'll believe it and stuff like if that. Someone tells you it long enough, yeah. Yeah, long enough. And I believe that to some extent. And I know there are other people that did too. I want to clear. I don't feel like a victim at all. No, no. I, 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 it's, I'm not saying the victim okay, aspect. Yeah. I'm just saying that. I feel very privileged, and I was Absolutely. completely underprivileged compared to almost everyone else I know. But uh, <laughs> almost. Yeah. And and, I feel and, and very privileged to have been born in, in Canada as opposed to oh, absolutely, dude. Somalia. You know what I mean? Like, and, and, you know, and, and we all have to kind of thank our lucky stars in that respect, even though the world's so fucked up, and even though you have issues like this. But, you know, at the, I guess at the end of the day, it comes back to you. Maybe I'm just rambling, but I, I think at the end of the day, it comes back to you. And if people knew themselves a bit more, I think it would be a lot different. 
because you can't know yourself when you're codependent and jumping into relationships too early. If we want to do a callback on that. Yeah, no, definitely. You gotta, you gotta be alone. The best thing that ever happened to me was moving to Vegas. I knew no one. I got off a plane with nothing booked, no hotel room, no place to stay, not a ton of money. Mm -hmm. And, uh, just started walking, Mm -hmm. started walking up, up Las Vegas Boulevard from, uh, McEwen, I think it's called McEwen Airport. It, it, it was like your religious retreat without the religion. You know, it, it there was, was very little religion involved. Oh, yeah. absolutely. It's Vegas. In you fact, know. I was losing my religion. <laughs> <laughs> like the REM song. <laughs> but that, that was actually Toronto for me. I brought it up multiple times. I know everybody's, some of you guys are getting sick. I of can't believe too. the amount of people who know who you are from that short trip up there. You know, yeah. like when I'm like, they're like, oh, yeah, I know Dave. He was up in Toronto for a bit. They all, like when I talk to comics from Toronto. Yeah. No, it's interesting. Well, I, I I did like at least three or four shows every week. Yeah. I I was grinding hard. I think it's because I wanted to distract myself, and I was going through a lot. Like I had a really bad breakup, and the girl went with some dude that was twice her age, and that really pissed me off because I felt inadequate. But I also was mad at myself too for allowing her to do that to me, and also, um, you know, I worked with my family, which was a which was a good experience. It was just frustrating sometimes because I didn't feel like I was doing everything that they wanted me to do and I didn't feel like I was contributing and sometimes when they would get on me I just like ah oh, fuck it you know what I mean and and you just take those moments where you're just like I don't want to deal with it just get the fuck out of here so you turn to a lot of stuff I mean I've never turned to like hard drugs or anything like that but I remember there's one day in particular when <clears throat> I got off work early my dad sent me home uh and I I was gonna go back to where we were staying but I said fuck it I'm just gonna walk you know or just drive and turned off my phone, turned off everything. And then I went down this little trail because Scarborough's very hilly. And you, you're actually from Scarborough, so you probably know what I'm talking about. Right, Detroit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, I, I was out that night when that, when that guy got stabbed at that, uh, at that community uh, party or whatever. Oh, yeah. On uh, Danzig Street. Um, I, I, like, what are you talking that. about, Toronto? Yeah, yeah, in Scarborough, Toronto. someone gets stabbed all the time. Yeah. Every homicide you hear about in Toronto happened in Scarborough. Yeah. Or recently in Etobicoke. Yeah, <laughs> Etobicoke, that's funny. <laughs> yeah. And anyway, so I, I go down this hill. There's this little path, and uh, I, you know, I drive down the path, and I just keep going for whatever reason. I just kept driving. Something like told me to keep going, even though there were signs up that says, "Hey, watch out for the foxes and the wolves," which freaked me out a bit. I'm like, "Fuck it, I'm gonna go." I'm in my pajama bottoms. I have my satchel on. I have a full charge. I got nothing to lose. And as you're I not d- afraid of the big bad wolf. I didn't give a fuck. And you already <laughs> knew what the fox said. So exactly. <laughs> that fox is a fox, man. See ding, 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 Damn, ding, man, you ding, see that fucking snout over there, dog? Shit. <laughs> um, yeah, this is how you know we've been talking for too long. Oh, well, it, it's good we're loosening up. But um, anyway, so as I was driving down, uh, there was like this little creek and this little river. And I was talking to one of my religious friends. I, I told him that was the closest I've had to a religious experience because in that moment, I felt solitude in terms of nature and the elements. I was able to go to Lake Ontario, just like drive near Lake Ontario. And after that, I met, like, these cool people. There were kids playing, and I, I, I could not stop smiling. I do not know what it was. And after that, like, as soon as I came back to Windsor, I haven't gone back to Toronto since, but as soon as I came back to Windsor, I'm like, I'm going to come back here and do my thing. Toronto's really cool. Toronto's cool. Oh, I love Toronto. As a tourist, the water's great. You know, it's uh, just a melting pot of culture and I, 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 you opportunity. Know, this is my home, but I felt at home up there because I liked – the diversity and I uh, like you know there's issues yeah the rent's ridiculous and it's very congested and some of the people can be dickheads but you get that everywhere so that was never a concern to me it was just the experience that I, it was something that I took away from it you know what I mean so that was like my Vegas and in, in your context in your story right yeah that's how you learn that's how you learn who you are absolutely and it's so important man because it, you know we're gonna wrap this up soon but I feel like when people are alone uh, that's when you see who you really are. Even when you do a podcast, when you do a number of things where it exposes you. And people are afraid to be exposed because it's not that they'll see something that they don't like. It's just they don't, They might not know how to deal with it once they notice it. Mm-hmm. For me, it was dealing with the things I know that I didn't like about myself. Uh, the insecurities that popped out, the inadequacies, and having to live vicariously through somebody else. They all they all emerged and they flooded. Yeah. And I was like, fuck, I want to stop this flood. Let me, put up the, let me put up the gates so I can prevent all this shit from coming. But at the same time, in order to handle the flood, I think you got to learn how to swim as well. Mm-hmm. You got to learn how to swim and you got to learn how to tread so yeah. that when you can swim out of it, you're going to emerge on top. It sounds like a really corny <laughs> corny analogy, but that's what I got out of it. No, it's good. It makes total sense. And you know, 
I'd recommend it to anyone if they can go. Everyone's like, oh, I need a friend to go backpacking across Europe with. Ah, uh, no, you don't. Don't do that. I, know, I understand, go. like, you can find people online who are, like, vetted as normal human beings and find a stranger to do it with. Same sex, do that, too, you know? Just yeah. young blonde chick running around uh, Europe alone. Yeah, yeah, I understand the concern, but yeah, it's, you'll it's, learn it's, way it's, more about who you are and what you want in life by doing that than anything else. You get, like, that girl in, like, Aruba or uh, Colombia that went missing. <laughs> right. You end up like all those those fucking guys. Yeah, no, it's true. You don't need that. It's so funny. I mean, I think you spend more if when you spend time alone. Because I did that a lot in Toronto too. I, I went to restaurants alone. Like I just hung out places, but I talked to people. And you talk to people like when you go to Europe and do all that stuff. It's important to do that as well. Made made better friends and better relationships, and you know you pursue your passion. All that good stuff will happen. Anyways, I think we're gonna wrap up. All right. Did you have fun? Yeah, it was a good show, man. Thanks for having me. No worries. Yeah, and, and this is not an endorsement, by the way. I don't know <laughs> if, you're, if you're running and stuff like that. You know what I mean? What? Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I, I have plans to. I don't know yeah. when, but yeah. Yeah, no, definitely. You know, it, I, I think I like that about in terms of municipal politics. You can make a difference. It's harder to do it on a federal level, even a provincial level. No, but you can level. actually make a difference. You There's no partisan can. BS. Yeah. You know, like you got to vote with your party. Right now, everyone's all gung-ho NDP. And you know what? I don't want to talk about federal politics right now. Yeah. But... Everyone is all, yeah, NDP, NDP. Well, NDP got majority of their votes in Quebec. Mm -hmm. Therefore, every time a bill goes through, if it's good for Quebec, even if it's bad for border cities, Windsor, our elected representatives have to vote pro-NDP because of partisan voting mm -hmm. in order to get the bill through. Mm -hmm. So it might be pro good for Quebec, but it's it's terrible for Windsor, and that's what's happening. And it, it's not just NDP. That's a really good example, though. Mm -hmm. uh, conservatives more with uh, at West, you know, like a lot of those interests are uh, represented right now in mm -hmm. uh, in the House. Uh, but on a municipal level, you can actually talk to people and get a group of people. There's, you know, six thousand people who come out to vote in your ward. That you're representing as a city councilor, what, and what, if you get two thousand of them to agree to something, you know that means you should take it seriously and get it done. Right? What I've always had an issue with in terms of politics is the labeling. I don't like the labeling because it's like, well, mean? well, I'm a conservative, I'm a liberal, I have this ideology, I have that ideology. It it, it always sounds like a competition of ideology. It makes no and sense. It makes no sense, and it's like picking a team, man. It's just like picking a baseball team. Hey, well, you're it, on my team. It's, it's not. Like you can have conservative values, but still be liberal. Oh, absolutely. You but, can but, be socially but, but, liberal. But, but, but that's my point. Like my point is that most people are, but you're always labeled as one thing. Well, because you have to pick what point poor part of their party's platform. Say that three times fast. Right you got to you got to pick which part of the party's platform uh, <laughs> most most uh interests you and does the most for the country or city or province yeah. that you feel uh, does most and you have to pick you have to pick based on that so basically i look side by side on fiscal responsibility the ndp are coming up they're changing some things which is really cool the liberals uh, unfortunately have never been pro um you know pro fiscal responsibility mm -hmm. Uh, and the conservatives have and mm -hmm. i don't like being labeled as a conservative i'm sorry i voted conservative you know but yeah. Um, I, I, it was the best choice fiscally based on what they and, said. And, and he, but like I said, you know, even just with just the labeling, I think sometimes when you say I'm a conservative or a liberal, people have this image. You know what I mean? It's it's like even like what's the, the image of a liberal in your mind? Uh, just you know, everybody like in terms of my mind, like well, sometimes you think of like the Occupy Wall Street people. You know, it's like hey man, you'd you know, say that as liberal? No, not I wouldn't say liberal, but I think that people have the image in terms of like well, they're progressive with this, they have this ideology, that ideology. I just I just think. Like I said, personally, you don't think I just, any I people who voted conservative street. were part of the Occupy Wall Street? Um, it's it's not the Occupy Wall Street thing specifically. I just mean more in terms of ideology, ideology and values and stuff like that. Because I I think we're all a mixed bag in that in that respect. I don't think anybody's liberal or conservative completely. We're all like mixed, and that that's my issue with like labeling parties and stuff. Because if 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 we have such a centering, like if you're if you're in the center so much, you can't really get a grasp of it. You know what I mean? Well, our parties are so tame here in Canada. That there is oh, no yeah. left and right. There's yeah. just right of center yeah. and just left of center. Yeah, that's we're, all there we're is. a bit different. That's all there is. In in America, our conservative party right now, our elected federally, uh, elected federally conservative party would be Democrats in the states. Mm -hmm. They're not. They're not hard right wingers. No. You know, people say, "Oh, the conservatives they they care about uh, they want to control a woman's body," and that that's not real. That's that's U.S. media. Like they're. We're not even supposed to talk about that. Like, if I ever go to a conservative function, which I don't anymore because I'm so angry at them and I'll probably never vote for them again. But when we go to those functions, 
you, we don't even uh, we don't even talk about that. There's no talk about abortion or marijuana, like yeah. it, you know. But everyone says, "Oh, conservatives, they want to take over women's bodies. They don't want you to have fun." You know, they're capitalist pigs. Yeah, blah, yeah, blah, you, blah. Have, you have to get people riled up and get you to vote for their team or be on their team. That's all it is. That, yeah. <laughs> It's all, it's always a, a choice between good versus evil with American politics. That's what it al- it always seems like it is, and I, it's entertaining. I fucking watch their politics over ours. Ours is put you to sleep, but <laughs> more pro America versus not pro America, and they try to point out why that person's that party's less American. Yeah, which I think's nuts. Oh, it is. <laughs> it is. Anyways, I think we're going to wrap this up. <laughs> Thanks for having me on the show. You can follow me on Twitter at at ha ha hadden h a h a h a d d o n or at the Comedy Quarry, at Comedy Quarry on Twitter. Find me on Facebook, Joshua Hero Hatton, or sorryimfunny.com. All, all the plugs that I was going to give you, you just gave yourself. Right on. So, Thanks for having me, Dave. I don't, no, yeah, I know. It was, it was good. I, uh, it was good to be back. I want to try and do this more often again. This has been the Squeaky Unclean Podcast. We're going to have uh, Ken Harris on the podcast soon, Michael Jeter, and a few more special guests who I've wanted to have on for a long time but have not had the opportunity to. I want to try and do this more regularly. You know, I take too much of long breaks, and hopefully I won't be as sick or as hungover. <laughs> huh. Thank, thank you for listening, guys. And uh, I don't know if if the roast uh, can get put up on YouTube. I'm gonna post it on my Facebook page. You can all check it out. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks, guys. Have a great day, and uh, keep it real. But don't make sure it doesn't go wrong, because then you'll end up on Vine. Take care. <laughs> <laughs>